All right, this is part three in my series of mycobacterium tuberculosis videos. Um, in this one, I'm really gonna talk about how do we diagnose TB. So I have previous videos that talk kind of about main characteristics surrounding the mycobacterium organisms, as well as the clinical syndromes that are associated with TB. But now we're gonna talk about the diagnosis. Diagnosis of TB is actually really tricky because basically, all of mycobacterium tuberculosis is wrapped up in a patient's immune response. And as hopefully you've figured out by now, um, patients' immune responses change drastically throughout the course of their lives. So that means we're constantly hitting a moving target for how we could potentially recognize TB with the tests that we have. So diagnosis and introduction to treatment. Um, I say introduction because I'm not gonna go into the anti-tuberculoids in depth. Your pharmacology discipline director, as well as some infectious disease specialists will handle that um, a little bit later. I'm going to basically talk about a bunch of different diagnostic options. Some are fairly new, some we've done for a long time. So we'll start with the traditional. So the first thing we're gonna wanna do is get a patient sample. And most of the time, that patient sample is going to be a sputum sample. Now, here's the problem with that. Sputum samples are rife with contaminant. The human mouth is disgusting. Um, there are lots of organisms that live in the mouth, some of which can cause pneumonia, which might present this way. Um, so you need to decontaminate it first. So the first thing you're gonna do is you're gonna stick it in sodium hydroxide. Then you're gonna centrifuge it to hyperconcentrate it. Now, we're gonna make this even more complicated because you don't need just one sputum sample. You actually need three sputum samples. And at least one of them needs to be that ooey gooey goodness first thing in the morning sputum sample. I want you to think about the last time you had a really bad cold, all right? You have a really bad cold, it's difficult to sleep, but think about it, you lay back, all night and everything kind of pools and collects toward the back and then you wake up and you spend the first five to ten minutes just trying to clear the gunk as my father calls it out of your lungs you literally would hack up a lung clean it off and then shove it back in if you could so you want this first thing sputum sample the sputum sample, that's first thing, that's got the gold because bacilli can be intermittent throughout the day, the rate at which they're shedding. So if you take three sputum samples, the first one first thing in the morning, it actually improves the yield. You want at least five mLs of sputum, which is a lot of sputum. Um, if you think about what five mLs of water is, if you had to produce this from your mouth, that's gonna take some work. Um, so you're going to want that early morning one, you're gonna want five mLs and you want three of them in a 24 hour period, okay? So that's just collecting the specimen. Now, what are we gonna do with it? We got a couple options. We can do an acid fast smear. Um, there are a couple acid fast stains. You can also do a couple cultures. There's a solid media culture and a liquid broth culture, and we can also do molecular tests. So we're going to go through each one of these one by one. Just one more note on acceptable specimens before we move on. So typically you're gonna ask for those three sputum samples one first thing in the morning, but you can't always control what you can get. So what else are we gonna use? Um, these are some other options, but notice some of these are contaminated. So like bronchial wash, laryngeal swab, the skin, soft tissue, gastric lavage, stool and urine. Now, why do we need all of these others? Well, one, some TB infections are extra pulmonary. So if you have a skin infection of TB, like TB pedagra, a sputum sample isn't gonna help you. Um, so you might need to pull from another place. If it's a contaminated source, you need to decontaminate it. Um, so a great option for that is something like sodium hydroxide. You want a strong base that will remove most of the contaminants that won't be able to survive like mycobacteria can with its unique mycolic acid cell wall. Um, 
You're also going to need to get rid of any components that might grow faster than TB because remember it's a really slow growing um, organism. There are several sterile body type, body sites though. The cerebrospinal fluid, the bone marrow, blood, all of these are sterile sites. So if you take those, um, it's a pretty good chance that if you're able to grow out TB, um, it would be the first thing to grow out because these are sterile. So these you wouldn't need to decontaminate, but this one you would. All right, you got two methods for staining. You got carbol fusion stain and you have fluorochrome stain. With the carbol fusion stain, it's pretty simple. You pour the acid, you pour the stain, then you add 3% acid, and then you add a blue counter stain. So stain, acid, counter stain. Then what you're looking for are red organisms on a blue background. If you see them, then guess what? You found some TB. If not, you didn't. There's also a fluorochrome stain, uh, a fluorochrome stain. It's a fluorescent stain. Um, the stain actually glows a pretty green color. Um, the D stain is slightly weaker. That's kind of the crux of the staining procedure. So when talking about carbol fusion acid stains, there's actually two Zeal Nielsen and Kenyon stain. Um, I'm really not going to harp on these except to say one thing. Zeal Nielsen requires heat to allow the stain to penetrate the cell wall. Um, typically, this has been done with a Bunsen burner in the lab. And consequently, Zeal Nielsen has kind of fallen out of favor because it is um, frowned upon to light things aflame in a lab. So Kenyon stain basically just increased the concentration of the basic fusion and phenol, um, and therefore you don't have to heat it, so you don't have to set things on fire, so Kenyon stain becomes a little bit more common. So one of the things I'm sometimes asked is, why do we have two different kinds of stains? Well, the answer is kind of twofold. Um, technology and availability of tech. Um, fluorescence is a lot younger than TB, so this kind of came up later. Um, and also kind of the availability. Remember, we're talking about endemic areas that might not have the same accessibility to technology that we do in some developed countries. Um, the fusion stain smears are traditional and they work, but it has limitations. It requires oil immersion. It takes a really long time. Um, things get missed because fatigue sets in. Um, and really, one of the things that we need to keep in mind is that you need examination by an experienced microscopist. Um, Bacterial burden is graded on levels one to four, and part of that is that you want to see if your treatment is working and if the bacterial grade is going down. And if this is missed or done improperly, it can affect treatment decisions. So this is kind of the method for reporting them and grading them. So if when you're looking on an acid fast stain, you don't see any bacilli, then it's negative, right? But if you see more than nine bacilli per field, then that's a four plus patient. And as the patient is being treated, I, obviously you would like to see the number of bacilli go down. Um, so there's a method for reporting where you have to report the number of bacilli seen per the number of fields that were investigated. Okay, let's say for argument's sake that you did, got your three sputum samples, you did an acid smear, and one of two things happened. It was positive, and you counted it, or it was negative, but the patient has something else going on that makes you think they're TB, either a positive PPD, or a GON complex on the chest x-ray, or symptomatology, or epidemiology, something that's just really making your inner spidey sense go, this is TB, and we need to investigate it. Um, if the acid fast smear came back positive, they're going to say to the pulmonologist or whoever the treating doctor is that the patient has, let's say, 3 plus TB. If it wasn't positive, you'll say you couldn't find any organisms. Regardless, the next thing the lab will do is start a culture. Why? Well, culture is still the gold standard for diagnosis. Um, culture gives better sensitivity. And remember, approximately 30% of patients are smear negative, even though they have pulmonary TB. Um, so you'll only catch these patients, this 30% of patients, if you do culture. Um, also, culture allows you to do susceptibility testing and make sure early that you don't have a multi-drug resistant strain of TB. Um, okay, so 
I mentioned earlier in a previous video that TB are highly fastidious organisms and they require very specific media and won't just grow on anything. They're kind of divas. Um, the original media used was Lowenstein Jensen. Um, this is basically a solid egg-based media as the albumin is really important. So this is a solid media. Middlebrook auger, um, you can actually get in either form, solid or broth. Um, both of them are good for growth. Both of them are albumin based. Um, the best culture media to use is actually the liquid uh, middle broth. broth. Um, this actually stimulates simulates the lung parenchyma and therefore it's kind of the best because the TV actually feels good um, at home. If you're a fan of Sketchy, Sketchy actually only men mentions Lowenstein Jensen, um, but Middlebrook is actually the better, faster option. So don't forget about that one. Um, furthermore, regardless of which of these you choose to grow, remember that you need to first decontaminate the sample. Um, and these will actually have antibiotics added to them, which will inhibit the growth of normal flora that's normally found in the oral cavity. So this is what MTB looks like unstained on a plate. Um, and then over here, you can see kind of this magenta stain of the ropes and cords. These actually indicate that this strain of MTB has something known as cord factor. Um, Cord factor is actually a virulence factor. When you see this without knowing what type of mycobacterium it could be, you know it's virulent. This is cording and it's practically pathognomonic. Um, so at this point, the pathologist or the lab will call and tell the treating physician, we'll isolate and find out exactly what we're dealing with, but this patient is growing a virulent pathogenic form of TB. Um, so what is cord factor? These are basically glycoproteins um, that are found in the cell wall that basically allow for clumping in it kind of a serpentine shape. Um, this is also a very important virulence factor that protects the bacteria by inducing the formation of those granulomas. Um, it's found only in virulent strains of TB, and it actually inhibits macrophage maturation and induces release of TNF-alpha. When this happens, the bacteria is kind of walled off by these frustrated, activated macrophages. Now, walling off itself off doesn't seem like a great thing for the organism, but it actually is. Think of it as using the body's own immune system to create a castle, a really big one with high walls and a moat so that its enemies, NK cells, CD8 T cells, real killers, can't get in. Um, the macrophages theoretically could be helpful, right? They could help to um, ingest this pathogen for us. Well, that's kind of part of the problem. With the increased TNF, um, the organism also is going to produce sulfatides. Um, sulfatides are created by TB to basically prevent fusion of the phagolysosome. So basically it protects TBs from, or TB from the phagocytic process. And so they actually accumulate in the phagosomes, basically creating uh, incompetent uh, phagolysosomes. Um, so in this way, the mycobacterium can live quite happily inside its macrophage castle for decades at a time. Okay, so now that we know it's MTB, how do we ID the specific strain? Also, we know that TB can actually be a complex of organisms that could cause disease, right? So chances are it's just MTB, but it could involve one of these other ones as well. So once we have that growth pattern in culture, how do we ID the specific strain species? Um, there's pretty much three ways to do this. The growth rate, so how quickly does it grow? What does it look like on Middlebrook or Lowenstein Jensen? And then um, does it produce a pigment? Um, and these are actually the same questions that are asked when we look at Runyon's classification system, even though MTV isn't technically um, classified by Runyon. Okay, so let's first talk about kind of what it's supposed to look like. For MTB, it likes body temperature um, and it'll grow in about one to three weeks, okay? And actually one would be exceptionally fast. Um, and that's really only in Middlebrook broth, okay? If you're looking at solid media, you're talking up to eight weeks. Um, however, the benefit of solid media or solid auger is that you can examine the colony morphology. So you're gonna wanna hold that plate for at least that long. 
Um, MTB is not a chromogen. It has this kind of buff and dry appearance. It kind of looks like, um, I'm going to be a little gross here. When you go and get a pedicure, and for those of you who don't get pedicures, you should try it, and they take that um, exfoliating thing and kind of rub it on your heels and all the dead skin that comes off of your heels, um, that actually, it kind of, it looks like a pile of dead skin to me um, that's just kind of been buffed off. Um, so this buff and dry appearance is what you would expect to see on Lowenstein Jensen. Um, we see this fairly often, um, and when you see it, you're practically done. You don't have to do anything. It just, it is MTB. Um, this is strictly when you see it on Lowenstein Jensen. Um, there are two biochemical properties used to ID it. I'm not going to talk about them. Um, niacin and nitrate reduction. Um, these are traditional methods for ID, and they're not really used anymore. So since we don't really do biochemical tests for TB, there's no catalase, coagulase, oxidase. So how the heck do we ID TB if we don't do any of those? Well, those tests are just too slow. They can take six to eight weeks to give you the answer because you have to first let it grow out. So really what we need is molecular testing. Um, in the old days, we would do liquid chromatography. It sped things up because we didn't need to wait as long to grow the organism. However, if any of you have ever done liquid chromatography, it is really, really slow. From getting the sample process to the running time, it takes a long time. Um, so conventional methods are the biochemical tests, but now what we use are actually DNA probes. Um, so these would be biochemical, so things like uh, niacin and nitrate. Um, this is uh, liquid chromatography, and now we just use DNA probes. So the modern diagnostic approach of DNA probes basically allows for rapid identification of these different types of tuberculosis. Um, basically, it uses a fluorescinated or horseradish peroxidase DNA um, strand for different strands of TB. We have probes for the most common mycobacterial species. We'll briefly touch in further videos on consaci and MAC. Um, M. gordone is actually typically a contaminant. So the other thing people do when they first wake up in the morning is drink some water. And M. gordone is often um, found in drinking water. So it's actually important to remember we are taking sputum samples. So let's say your patient takes a drink of water and then gives you a sample. You might see M. gordone. It doesn't mean it's mycobacterium tuberculosis. It just means that they could have a contaminate. Um, you can measure whether or not it's just one of the strains using this chemiluminescence or a fluorimeter. Um, there are over 70 different species, but the benefit of this, the real benefit is this is really rapid. Um, you can take what used to take weeks and figure out what's going on in about two hours. Um, so you have to actually understand that this is why we're moving to this, even though culture is still the golden kind of um, I, the golden rule, this is obviously an incredible aid in quick identification of patients. Um, at Rush, we see about 12 TB patients per year, but we actually put a lot more in isolation on suspicion of TB while we rule them out. So we don't want to rule people out too quickly, um, but we don't want to keep them around longer than they have to. So two hours while we wait to see if it's actually TB and keep everybody safe is, is actually pretty good. Okay, now we're going to talk about the actual tuberculin skin test. So far, we've talked about the ways we could diagnose TB by either lab test or symptomatology, right? Patient comes in, persistent cough, bloody sputum, night sweats, maybe from an endemic age and a person of a certain age with reduced cell-mediated immunity. Now we'll talk about the immunologic reasons. Um, these can be really useful in patients with latent TB who are not experiencing symptoms. So we're talking about patients who have clearly been infected but have no symptoms or signs. They get a chest X-ray and that gone complex is evident. So in some cases, they pop immunologically without these other things being known. Um, so the standard one we're gonna talk about is the TST, the tuberculin skin test. Um, this one, 
was originally called um, the Manteau test or Mantu test, named after Dr. Mantu. Um, he is actually the discoverer of it. Initially, this was performed using boiled tuberculi bacilli, sometimes referred to as Cox or old tuberculoid because Co uh, Koch uh, first described it in 1892. Um, these days, we use Sievert's purified protein precipitate, um, and this single lot has actually was actually derived in the 1940s. Um, and you basically take a dose of PPD, you inject it intradermally into the forearm using a 27 gauge syringe, and you look for an induration 48 to 72 hours later. The main problem with this is that you cannot distinguish between old TB and active infection, because really what this is, is a type four hypersensitivity response. Uh, what it is, is you're basically looking for a delayed reaction to the um, tuberculin peptide. So you're waiting for CD4 positive Th1 memory cells to become activated, produce interferons, and produce inflammation, and that inflammation is your induration. So if you have a good memory response, you're going to make a huge induration. Um, that doesn't mean you have active TB, though. Okay, so when interpreting the induration, we actually need to take a lot of things into account for the different populations you see. Um, the first thing is their immune response or their immune status, and the second is their risk factors. So you're actually gonna measure the width of the induration, and that's actually really key to remember. So if this is a patient's arm, all right, I don't care if this little dot is 10 centimeters up. That doesn't matter. It's how wide, okay? So if this induration becomes like this, that's a really big response. It doesn't matter how tall it is. It matters how wide it is. Um, if the patient is immunosuppressed or an organ transplant recipient or immunosuppressed for any reason, cancer, autoimmune disease, um, I don't know, uh, significant age, um, that changes. So these patients are kind of not capable of a vigorous response. So the induration might be smaller, okay? So if you have somebody with who is HIV positive and their induration is five millimeters, that's a positive response in that patient. Um, if you have a patient who's completely healthy and they have a five millimeter induration, that is not a positive response, okay? So you need to think about who, what the immune status is. And that's not all. You also have to think about their living arrangements, okay? So um, recent immigrants have a higher likelihood of having TB than patients who have never left the US. Um, same with patients with other significant um, risk factors, injection drug users, um, patients or, sorry, residents or employees of prisons, nursing homes, hospitals, healthcare um, shelters, homeless shelters, children less than four, all of these patients have higher risk and also changes in their ability to mount a strong immune response. So they kind of go in the middle. They would need an induration that is wider than 10 millimeters. But if you're a person with no significant health concerns, a strong immune response, and no significant risk factors, your induration would not be positive until it is greater than 15 millimeters wide. So you need to kind of consider the whole clinical picture when reading a TB induration. Okay, so that seems pretty easy, right? Well, it's never that black and white. There are several reasons a patient may demonstrate a false positive or a false negative. Um, so there are a couple of reasons a patient might get a false positive. Um, that would include a previous TB infection. In some cases, we'll see a false positive when a patient is infected with a non-tuberculous uh, mycobacterium. Um, so like they had M. leprae or M. consace, um, and it's or MAC, and it's not tuberculosis, but it's still mycobacteria. The other is BCG vaccine. Um, this is the Bacille Calmet Guerin vaccine. My apologies to anybody who speaks French. Um, this is a TB vaccine that many people outside the U.S. have had. Um, it's often used in countries with high TB prevalence to prevent childhood meningitis and miliary disease. However, we do not use the PCG vaccine in the U.S. for a couple of reasons. One, we have relatively low prevalence of TB in the U.S. Two, it has been shown to have a at 
best variable effectiveness against adult pulmonary TB. And three, it leads to false positive um, TST tests, which we use to kind of keep control of TB in the country. However, a false positive isn't too big a deal. We can treat them and they'll be fine. We can culture or try to do a molecular test. We can look for symptoms. The bigger concern is actually the false negative, right? Because these are the group of patients we have to worry about because they might not be able to mount a strong enough um, response to make a positive TST test. And these are the same patients that then could also go on to create more patients that basically could go on to infect others. And here are the reasons why um, a patient might give a false negative. So um, they have poor cell-mediated immunity, like an AIDS patient. If they were only very recently infected, like within a couple of days, the T cell response might not have geared up yet. Um, they received the they received some sort of vaccine that um, is kind of skewing their immune response. So, for example, like they recently got the MMRV, um, or they have a very young age or a very old age. Again, just that cell-mediated immunity. Okay, I'm not really going to talk much about treatment. This is going to be covered a lot later. All I'll say about it is that it is usually a very long treatment course, 6 to 12 months. And because treatment resistance is so important, we often treat with a combination of drugs. Um, what helps me to think um, that is, I kind of use the acronym TB needs to be RIPE. RIPE is the acronym. Um, and the drugs are rifampinin, um, isoniazid, uh, pyrzinimid, and um, ethambutol. Um, in some cases, they'll add in streptomycin, um, and you can do chemoprophylaxis. Um, but that's uh, that's still going to be for a long time. So um, this will all be covered in much more detail later in your education in your M2 year.